an appointment with death. Mr. Williams was minding his own business in his living room when he received an interesting phone call. Hello? Good morning. We have an appointment at 9.30. Are you ready? Ready? I, I, I have no appointments in my diary. It's my day off. Who is this? This is death. I am always on time for my appointments. You are in my diary for 9.30 a.m. It's Mr. Smith, isn't it? 21 Beecham Grove. Look, I don't know who you are or why you think this is funny, but I have no intention of telling you my address. And you can rest assured that I'm not Mr. Smith. Come now, Mr. Smith. You have nothing to fear. Death is a natural part of life. I will see you in ten minutes. Stop this now. Don't call me again or I will call the police. Do you hear me? 9.30, Mr. Smith. Make sure you're ready. The clock's ticking. I will see you in nine minutes and 45 seconds. Look here, you. Whoever you are, you're not funny. Hello? Hello? Uh, hi, John. Are you, are you all right? I've just, I've just received the most bizarre prank call. All good here, Mike. I was just wondering if you fancied a game of golf later? It's a beautiful day. Who pranked you? It, it was really odd. This man called me and told me I was booked for a meeting with him at 9.30 this morning at my house. Who the hell is this? I asked him. Death, he said. Can you believe that? <laughs> John, it really spooked me. He had the strangest voice. It's, it's hard to explain, but it was as though his voice was everywhere at once. Ask him if he can wait until after our game of golf. Have you looked out your window? They say that when your time's nearly up, you'll see him coming. <laughs> Oh, you're hilarious. Do you know that? You should become a comedian, John. I try, mate. One thing's for sure. My humour's better than your golf. What time are you free so I can thrash you? Oh, give me half an hour or so. I'll see you at Heathview around ten, all right? See you there, mate. See you at ten, John. Mr Williams looked at his phone, half expecting it to ring again. It was 9.22am. He walked over to the bay window of his front room, pulled aside one of the curtains and looked outside. There was nobody coming up the street. So, he went to the other side of the bay window and pulled that curtain aside. No reaper today. That was a relief, and he couldn't help but smile to himself as he made his way upstairs to find his golf clubs. It's funny how we often doubt our own sanity when the right buttons are pressed. Time to find a suitable shirt and pair of trousers. Mr. Williams wasn't the kind of man who would turn up at a golf club unprepared. It didn't take him long to get ready. But no sooner had he got changed and took his clubs downstairs, the phone rang yet again. Hello? Hello again, Mr. Smith. Death here. Have you managed to get your affairs in order? You can never be too prepared. And I did give you notice. Why don't you get lost? How the hell did you get this number? Who put you up to this? Oh dear, you really aren't prepared at all, are you? They don't tell me the details, Mr. Smith. All I know is that you are due at 9.30, and meet you I will, very shortly after my other appointment. They do keep me busy, you know. I'm hanging up now. 
Bye bye. Mr. Williams hung up the phone, but if he was honest with himself, he would have to admit to being more than a little anxious. The mind often plays tricks on us, like when kids imagine they can hear the sound of Santa's footsteps the evening before Christmas Day, except they want to believe it's true. Mike Williams didn't believe the Reaper was coming for him, but a niggling doubt had conjured up images of him falling down the stairs with his golf bag or having a heart attack at exactly 9.30. Those same doubts provoked an urge within him to check the time. It was 9.27 a.m. The phone rang again. He could see it was a withheld number. Go away, please. This isn't funny anymore. Do you understand? I don't know how you got my number, but I don't know you. You've had your fun. Whoever got you to do this can have a laugh with me later in the parlour, okay? (sighs) I can see we won't be able to do this the easy way. Take a look out of the window, Mr. Smith. As though under the spell of a master hypnotist, and as unlikely as it seemed, Mr. Williams found himself walking towards the front room's bay windows as though in a trance, his phone arm lowering as he did so. He pulled aside the curtain to look up the street, Stanley, from two doors away, was getting into his car. There was nobody else there. As he went to the other bay window, his whole being was filled with dread and the sense that something terrible had already occurred. Except this time, he hadn't burnt the chicken or forgot to turn the lights off on his car. Oh no, this was altogether different. He pulled back the curtain aside with a jerk, almost like a reveal, but he knew there would be no star prize waiting to be won. Nobody. There was nobody there. No! The Reaper wasn't coming from either end of the street. He was standing across the road. As Williams looked out the main window, he could see the tall figure standing in front of his neighbor's house. Brian, from number 20, suddenly emerged from the front door and seemingly walked right through death. Death was stood, stock still, standing around eight feet tall, with his hood up, with no sign of a face. In his right hand, he held his scythe. Mr. Williams dropped his phone. His trousers felt wet and warm. His bladder had emptied. With dry lips, heart pounding, eyes unblinking, he slowly walked backwards from the window one tiny step at a time. Now, he was acutely aware that time was running out. If he was due to die within a minute or so, it could be anything. Heart attack, stroke, a fall. Death raised his left hand and waved slowly. Then the unthinkable happened. The Reaper began taking a step towards the house in horrible slow motion. This was anyone's worst nightmare. If you have ever found yourself in a dangerous situation before, you will recognize the feeling you get when you snap out of terror mode, when the only person who can save you is you. At such times, it is often better to think aloud. This is no time for panic. Mike, think. Take the time. 9.28. I have to get out of here. When time is running out, even the simplest task can become impossible. Tying one's shoelaces, putting the security code into the phone, or, as was the case for Mr. Williams during the last 90 seconds of his life, finding the key for the front door's deadlock. He ran to the back of the house, and in his rush to twist the back door key, which could be temperamental at the best of times, he broke it clean off. A back door escape was now out of the question. There really was only one thing for it. He would have to climb out of the only window that he could fit through, the upstairs window in his bedroom. Williams had never ran so fast, and now he was charging up the stairs like an Olympic athlete. He dived into his bedroom over the window and opened it. 
there was a moment of calm. He knew he'd made it in time. He checked his phone. It was 9.29 and 5 seconds. If he jumped now, there was no way he could die. 9.30 was almost a minute away and it really wasn't that much of a drop. He jumped. Unfortunately for Mr. Williams, his foot caught onto the roof of the bay window, causing him to somersault in the middle of his descent. Instead of landing on his feet or even his body, he was forced to dive around seven feet head first into the paving flags below. He took his last breath. William's spirit climbed out of his now dead body. You bastard! I'm not Smith! Extraordinary. 9.29 and 45 seconds. You're early. Their moment was interrupted by the sound of a motor vehicle careering down the street. It was out of control. The car, a 2008 Ford Mondeo, came to a complete stop having crashed at speed into 21 Beecham Grove. Williams and Death both looked at the scene in astonishment. A man's now lifeless body could be seen slumped against the steering wheel. His soul clambered out of the vehicle. He looked back at whom he had been and what was left of the car, scratching his head in bewilderment. Death looked at his watch. 9.30 a.m. Mr. Smith, I presume? <laughs> An appointment with death was written, directed, and produced for Radio Sangam by Martin Morrison. The story was narrated by Shiggy Pacta. Death was played by Mark Foster. Mr. Williams was played by David Nixon. And John was played by Martin Morrison. The music score was written and produced by Martin Morrison. We hope you've enjoyed this play. There'll be a lot more to follow. <laughs>